Um, so I'm going to talk about government surveillance today. Uh, I spent the last six years working on a PhD, which was specifically focused on the issue I'll be uh, describing today. And specifically, what I'll, be, what I'll be talking about is the way that the companies that we trust our data to, phone companies, internet companies, now sort of spy on us. Uh, they are the long arm of the government. So this is what wiretapping looks like in the movies. FBI agent hunched over in an unmarked van, pair of headphones on, listening to a telephone call that's taking place in a building next door. This is wiretapping in the movies, but this is not wiretapping today. Surveillance today looks like this. Someone typing at a keyboard, usually in an air-conditioned office several hundred miles away from the place where the actual telephone call or, or email is, is being composed. What I want you to think about is whose, keyboard, or whose fingers are typing at the keyboard. It's not the FBI agent for the most part. It's not the police officer. It's not an NSA employee. In most cases, it's someone working for, for one of the companies to whom we entrust our private data. It's someone working for Google, for Facebook, for Verizon, Sprint. Someone working for one of these telecommunications companies, the companies we pay, sometimes with our money, but often increasingly with our data. And because of the business models that are now dominant in Silicon Valley, where you exchange your information for free service, these companies have an incentive to keep data about us as long as they can. And once they keep this data, once they store it for monetization or customization or behavioral advertising purposes, it's there for the police to come and ask for at a later date. <coughs> right, so we know these companies are receiving requests. What do we know about the scale of requests? So we know a little bit about different types of information. And what we know the most about are wiretaps. These are uh, real-time interception of communications content. This is uh, when the government listens to your phone call as you're making it, reads your email as you're sending it, that kind of thing. Um, the reason we know so much about this is because there are annual reports put out, put out by the courts. So the, the writing on this graph is a little bit small, but the important thing you need to understand is that red is uh, red are the federal wiretaps and blue are the state wiretaps and the, uh, the axis on the bottom is, the, is, is time. Uh, and so what you can see is that back in 1968, there were about 250 wiretaps a year. Fast forward to 2011 and there are about 2,700 wiretaps a year. The vast majority of these are by states. You can see that the numbers for federal agencies hasn't really gone up too much over the last few years. This is, uh, this is an image that I think should be familiar to folks here in Chicago. The Prohibition era was a, a big deal, lots of crime, mafia, that, that sort of thing. Um, the wiretapping that really sort of took off uh, in, in that era was, was focused on, on, on Prohibition. And in fact, the first Supreme Court case to ever analyze uh, law enforcement use of intercept powers uh, was called the Olmstead case. It, was, it reached the Supreme Court in 1928. Olmstead was a Seattle a uh, boot, bootlegger who was smuggling uh, uh, Canadian whiskey, I think, or maybe rum across the border. So for, for that, that decade or so, most of the interceptions that were taking place were for, uh, for prohibition, for th this particular substance that uh, our government had decided that people, they didn't want people to have. Fast forward to through a few years. So this chart shows uh, the kind of crimes being used to investigate, uh, the, the kinds of crimes that they're getting wiretap orders for today. Uh, red is every crime other than drugs, and blue are drugs. And you can see that the vast majority of interception today, real-time interception, is for drug, drug crimes. I think it's about 81% of state wiretaps, and I think somewhere in the ballpark of 95% of federal interceptions are for drug crimes. The war on drugs leads to a surveillance state. But these are only the wiretap numbers. These are official reports that we have about the real-time interception of content. There are other ways that the government can get our information, uh, whether it is asking for stored information from internet service providers, asking for stored records that the phone companies have lying around. Uh, and we know far less about that because there are, there are, in some cases, there are no reports at all. And in other cases, the reports are not very good or never get made public. So we know a little bit from certain companies that have voluntarily published information. So Google was sort of the first 
big internet company to voluntarily publish information about its law enforcement um, process and, and the number of requests it receives. We know that Google gets about 6,000 requests every six months. That's about 12,000 requests from US law enforcement agencies every year. Obviously, that's more than the sort of 3,000 or so wiretaps that happen nationwide, but that could be for people's email boxes, search histories, social networking information, um, Google Voice information. The company has a lot of information about, about people, but that's just Google. Um, we also know uh, about information that Twitter has made public. Twitter has also followed Google's lead and started publishing uh, annual reports. We know from Twitter that in the first six months of this year, they received uh, about 800 requests uh, for, I think, about 1,000, or uh, yeah, uh, 1,100 users' accounts. Google and Twitter have decided to voluntarily make this information public. There's nothing requiring them to, to do so, and so we should be appreciative of the fact that they're at least willing to shine a little bit of light voluntarily on this topic. Uh, what I want you to understand in this area is that these companies are, are not trying to assist the government. They're not going out of their way to, to wiretap us. It's just that if they have our data, they are obligated to hand it over. Um, there's nothing they can really do about that other than to not keep the data, and that conflicts with their business model. So they keep it and then hand it over uh, to the police. So we know about Google. We know about Twitter. Uh, unfortunately, Facebook has not made any information public, so we don't know how many requests uh, they get. Uh, of course, it's not just law enforcement. Uh, divorce lawyers apparently are, are making keen use uh, of subpoenas and, and that kind of thing to Facebook. But these companies are, are sort of small fries. In, in the grand scheme of surveillance, the FBI is not really uh, depending on Google and Facebook uh, and Twitter. There are bigger fish for them to, to, to deal with. Um, and that is the phone companies. Uh, uh, so I think I missed one. Did I go back? No, OK, sorry. Um, so the phone companies, Sprint, uh, AT&T, Verizon, th these companies receive 1.5 million requests a year. We learned this earlier this summer. Um, uh, Mr. Markey, a, a congressman from Massachusetts, sent a letter to all of the phone companies and said, tell us how many requests you receive. The number is 1.5 million. That is requests for geolocation data. That's requests for call detail records, who you call, where you are when you call, the text messages you send, all kinds of information. And so compared to the numbers that Google gets, the phone companies are really where it's at right now for surveillance. This is 1.5 million times a year, but we still don't know very much about this. Um, the individuals whom are, who are arrested based on this information will eventually find out, but if the government gets your location data uh, and you're never charged with a crime, you're never arrested, you will likely never know that it happens. You, there's no letter in the mail that's sent to you to let you know that the government obtained your information from, from a phone company. So when the phone companies are receiving 1.5 million requests, that's a lot of requests. And of course, they all have teams of people who respond to these requests. Sprint, I think, has about 200 employees. We assume that Verizon and AT&T have a similar size staff. How do they deal with that flood of requests? 1.5 million requests is a huge number to deal with. So I went to a surveillance conference a few years ago in, in Washington, D.C., and I snuck in, and I secretly recorded a Sprint Electronic Surveillance Manager. Um, and uh, he was speaking on a panel with a bunch of other uh, telephone company employees, and he revealed uh, that Sprint you know, sort of had, had sort of been crushed by this. I'm just going to read you his quote. Uh, so we turned on our GPS tool web interface for law enforcement about one year ago, and we just passed 8 million requests. There is no way on earth my team could have handled 8 million requests from law enforcement just for GPS alone. So what Sprint did, rather than have law enforcement agents call them up every time they needed something, they built a self-service website, something akin to Google Maps. They fa the police fax over a request, they get a username and password, and then they can log in and at, you know, at, at their convenience, from the comfort of their desk, just log in and see a little dot moving around the map. Um, Paul also added, Quote, the tool is just really caught on fire with law enforcement. They love that it's extremely inexpensive to operate and easy to use. Right? And who wouldn't want to deal that, do things this way? If the previous version of surveillance involved faxing over a request, waiting on hold for 20 minutes to get a single data point, who wouldn't want to use an easy to use website? Well, so Sprint bought Nextel, which was a, a, competitive, a competing t telephone service a few years ago. Uh, Nextel's law enforcement handbook, this is sort of like a, a document that all the phone companies produce and give to the police, 
Nextel's law enforcement handbook was leaked onto the internet a few years ago, and this is their 2003 handbook. What I want you to see uh, is that they charged, back in 2003, um, $150 for every GPS ping. A ping is when the government finds out where you are in this very moment. So back in 2000, 2003, Nextel was charging 150 bucks a go for this information. In 2009, Sprint gave this away 8 million times. Now, if Sprint were charging 150 bucks a go 8 million times, that's a lot of money. And in fact, back in 2009, Sprint was bleeding money left, right, and center. This would have been uh, a nice infusion of cash. Now, they didn't go down this path. They instead moved to a slightly different model. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. This is from some documents that ACLU obtained this year uh, in a FOIA lawsuit. Uh, this, so Sprint has actually moved to a, uh, a system of all-you-can-eat um, a service for law enforcement, they now charge a $20 manual fee, uh, a $20 fee if, the, if someone types something at a keyboard. If the law enforcement officer logs in and gets it themselves, it is just $30 flat fee per month per targeted user. So Sprint set up this website, the police log in, they can get as many, as many data points as they want for 30 bucks a month, whereas just seven or eight years ago, it would have been uh, 150 bucks per go. Sprint's not alone. T-Mobile has set up their own GPS tool online. They charge $100 a day for the use of this service, certainly cheaper than $150 per ping. And AT&T has also set one up. It's $100 to activate and then just $25 per day for law enforcement to track you wherever you go 24 hours a day. So this is really interesting. It's interesting that in response to this flood of requests, what's happened is that the telephone companies have automated their systems, right? Rather than deal with these requests manually, they let the police sort of help themselves within some sort of legal limits. But the, the difficulty of getting the data has gone down. Well, two things protect us from a surveillance state, from becoming, from becoming overwhelmed by law enforcement surveillance and from it becoming far too great. One is the law. There are laws that protect us from a government abuse, that, from, that protect us from this extremely invasive surveillance power. Because with these powers, the government can read what we're typing. They can see what we're searching for. And of course, Google is like our most trusted friend, right? It's like your psychiatrist and your doctor and your rabbi all in one. Google knows when you're sick before you tell your doctor. They know when you're gonna break up with your partner before you tell them. Google knows everything and law enforcement can get this information. Uh, and so we rely on the law to make sure that the police only have access to this kind of information at the right time and you know, under the right circumstances and with the appropriate legal checks and balances. Unfortunately, the law that regulates law enforcement access to internet communications is called the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. This law dates back from 1986. Now, I don't know how many of you were online in 1986. If you were using internet communications then, you were probably using CompuServe or maybe AOL. And if you had a cell phone, it was the size of a brick, had a 20-minute battery, and probably cost you 100 bucks a month. The law that regulates surveillance is so old. It doesn't mention the term location. It was written in an era where people had one megabyte inboxes, not 10 gigabyte inboxes. And so it is hopelessly out of date. It does not adequately protect us. All right, but the law isn't the only thing. Remember, there are two things that protect us from the surveillance state. And the second one is the expense or difficulty of surveillance. Right, 20 years ago, if the police wanted to track you as you moved around town, they would put a team of agents following your movements tailing you, right? And you'd look in the rearview mirror, and if you saw the same car every five minutes, you'd know you were being followed, so they'd need a few cars, and they'd need 24-hour shifts, and that's expensive. Today, when they can track you for $30 a month, that lowers the threshold, makes it much cheaper, makes it much easier. It means they can surveil many more people with a fixed or even shrinking budget. Since I'm in Chicago, I want to leave you, the, I want to leave you with this quote from Judge Richard Posner, who is uh, one of the leading judges on the Seventh Circuit. This is from the case U.S. v. Garcia from 2007. And he said that te technological progress poses a threat to privacy by enabling an extent of surveillance that in earlier times would have been prohibitively expensive. Internet companies have lowered the cost of everything, of communications, of connecting with friends, of finding things that previously we never knew existed. But they have also lowered the cost of surveillance.
Thank you very much.